Our broadcast today finds us still in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, and we're going to be taking a little tour of the universe in today's broadcast. find yourself, uh, we're going to pick up in the 8th chapter in verse 29. Why don't you find your place in God's Word, and let's look to Jesus in a word of prayer as we get started. Lord God, thank you for the broadcast today, and I pray that the Word of God might have free course and use it in your people's lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Book of Romans was written by the greatest theologian that ever walked the face of the earth, the Apostle Paul. It is indeed the greatest doctrinal book ever written in history, the book of Romans is, and the eighth chapter no doubt is the greatest chapter in the book of Romans. So we are looking at some very profound, heavy truths, to say the least. And I'm going to back up a little bit and discuss two of them that we looked at in our last broadcast because maybe you were out of town and maybe you missed those two messages. In any event, last week we discussed Right in the middle of the book of Romans, we found the Apostle Paul touching on biblical prophecy. I'm going to read this verse to you. This is uh, <clears throat> found at uh, verse uh, 23. We are eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We are eagerly waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Apostle Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ right in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. How sad it is that this doctrine of the second coming is so neglected in today's society, in today's church, in today's pulpits. Ignored, horribly ignored. I think that we've got, and the problem is, we've got a theology that I like to call blender theology. And what I mean by that is, these folks take a little bit of grace and a little bit of law and they throw it into a blender and they take a little bit of the Old Testament prophecy, a little bit of the New Testament prophecy, and they turn the blender on. And by the time they're done, they come up with this mixture and they're not quite sure whether we're under the law or we're under grace and we know that Jesus came the first time, but we're not, not quite sure whether he's coming again the second time. And therefore, they don't preach the second coming of Christ the way that I believe they should. It's called the blessed hope of the church. And it needs to be preached. It's extraordinarily important doctrine. Eighth chapter of Romans, we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies. That, my friends, is the rapture, the second coming of Jesus for his church. Maybe to pinpoint the importance of that particular teaching, I might tell you a little story, a true story. A young man, a teenager, lived in North Carolina. And he belonged to a, uh, a church that uh, had a kind of a blender theology. He went there his entire life, and they never talked about the second coming of Christ, not once. No message on the rapture, not once. And uh, a friend of his invited him to a, uh, a gospel meeting in a tent. This evangelist was coming to town for a couple of days. And he said, sure, I'll, I'll go with you. Why not? I've got nothing to lose. So the two of them sat there through the tent meeting, and the brother got up, and he preached about Jesus is coming back again. He's going to translate the church, change our vile bodies into glorious bodies, and Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this planet and reign for a thousand years. This young man had never heard this kind of preaching before in his life, not even once. And he was enthralled, enthralled with this message of the second coming. And when the evangelist offered an invitation to those who want to get saved to come forward, he was the first one out of his chair, and he went forward. He trusted Christ as his personal Savior. And who was that young man? None other than the great Billy Graham himself. Can you imagine Billy Graham? And how God used that man and how he went on to preach the gospel and how he always, always talked about the second coming of Jesus. It had such an impact on his own life. He had to tell others about it. 
and how God used that man and how indeed we're going to miss him. You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes the Soviet Union ever made was inviting Billy to come and speak in Moscow. <laughs> I suspect that uh, the Soviet uh, powers to be were kind of hounded into that, that people were sick and tired of the bondage of communism and they wanted some freedom. And they had uh, television sets back then in the 60s. They had just got on the common guy and they saw it was, well, it wasn't exactly the workers' paradise, the Soviet Union, is, it was uh, sold to be. In any event, they allowed Billy Graham to come and speak in Moscow. And hundreds of thousands of people showed up in the stadium and he preached the gospel clearly in the second coming of Christ. Clearly, thousands of people came forward and got saved. Even Soviet soldiers were coming forward getting saved. And then Billy went to Romania. And that, of course, was also behind the Iron Curtain, and preached the gospel to those folks. Then he went to Poland, preached the gospel to those folks. Three or four months later, the Iron Curtain crumbled. The Berlin Wall fell, and the old Soviet Union fell apart at the seams. Ronald Reagan was given a lot of credit for that, but I think that Billy Graham had a lot more to do with it than President Reagan. And of course, God did it because he was God's ambassador, God's ambassador. <coughs> Excuse me. One time, Billy Graham came and held a huge crusade in New York City, Madison Square Gardens, and <coughs> couldn't feed it, fill, fill, fill the place. There were enough people. There weren't enough seats to fill the place up. And so they, they had a great big meeting in Madison Square Gardens, an outdoor message, and over a million, 100,000 people showed up to hear Billy Graham speak. What a wonderful man of God and how wonderfully the Lord used him. I don't think we're going to see another Billy Graham in our lifetime. Well, <clears throat> the second coming of Christ is most important to preach. It needs to be preached. God uses that message. The Word of God is filled with the second coming of Christ. 25% of the Bible is prophetic in nature. Half of that has to do with Jesus coming back. In our last broadcast, we also looked at this most remarkable verse, and let me revisit it slightly. This is, as uh, Dr. Torrey said, it's a soft pillow for a tired head. Romans 8, 28. Listen to it. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good. In the light of what, Paul? in the light of the suffering that the Apostle Paul had just admitted that he was going through. Paul says the suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed, but we're suffering. We need, we need some light thrown on that truth. If God is a loving, all-powerful God, how come we're suffering as God's people? Paul says all things are working together for good. God is using all these terrible, sour instances to turn something into beauty, to make something wonderful out. He takes them all. He's a great conductor. He takes all the discord of life, and he turns it into wonderful, beautiful harmony. God causes all things to work together for good. And by the way, we have a great story in the Old Testament. That, and by the way, this is the, probably the greatest cause of stumbling of lost people in the Bible. Why does a loving God cause people to suffer? It's a huge stumbling block to them. And it brings about great evil when they stumble there. You know, a man one time had a young niece that came down with a terrible, terrible, debilitating disease. And she died a slow, painful death. And after the young lady died, this man said, I am not going to believe that a loving God could allow that to happen, therefore there is no God at all. And I need a way, by the way, to explain and to prove that there is no God. That man's name was Charles Darwin. Now, you thought that the uh, theory of evolution was set forth to be scientific and to prove that scientifically that there is no God. No, it had nothing to do with science. It had everything to do with an angry man, angry at God, because his niece died a slow, painful death. Charles Darwin, if he had read the book of Job, he would have had some true insight 
and to why his niece died. In the book of Job, we discover that God pulls back the veil and he reveals to humanity the reasons for things happen. It's the first book written in the Word of God. It's the oldest book. God knew we'd have a problem in this area. Job lost everything. He lost his ten children, not just a niece, his ten kids. Then he lost his wealth. He was an extraordinarily wealthy man. Then he lost his health. And he was able to say, the Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was doing fine up to that point. And then three of his so-called friends came along and said, Job, we know what the problem is with you. We know that God is a righteous God, and he blesses those who are righteous, and he uh, punishes those that are evil. And we see right away that what's going on in your life is you are a sinful person because this judgment from God has come upon you. Poor old Job Talk about being misunderstood and misjudged. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. And you know what Job said? He threw in the towel. He gave up on God. He said, why was I even born? Would have been better if I was carried from my mother's womb dead to a tomb than to have to live through this stinking life. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but that's what he said. I can't believe it. Cursed is the day that a man said a, a, ma a male child is born. It was horrible. I wish that I was never born. Now, friends, that doesn't sound much like a triumphant Christian to me. I don't know how you feel about that. In any event, I'll tell you how God feels about it. He complained and whined until God finally said, Okay, Job, I'm going to ask you some questions. You've been asking me a lot of questions. Now, I'm going to ask you some. He asked Job over 60 questions. Questions. Here's the first question, Job. And brother, he took him and he toured through the universe. Let's go back in time a little bit here, Job. Let's go on back to when I created the universe. I spoke, Job. Here you are standing alongside of me. I spoke. And this universe came into existence. Where were you, Job, when I did that? No answer. Job, let's go to another part of my universe and see if how smart you are. And God took him out into outer space and showed him Orion, all these different constellations. And he said, Job, where were you when I stretched out the heavens, Job? Do you know how I did that? Do you have an answer for me? And of course, Job put his hand over his mouth like this because he didn't have any answer. I'm not done, Job. Let's go on down to the bottom of the ocean. I'm going to show you something that nobody else has seen before. Took him on down to the bottom of the ocean and said, Job, look at that spring of water coming out of the ground like there. Look at that. Hot water coming out of the ground. Do you know how I did that, Job? Do you know how I made that? And by the way, man didn't figure this one out until the 19th century. I think when Benjamin Franklin figured out that hot water was coming out and that's what caused the Gulf Stream. <laughs> In any event, Job had no answer for him. God wasn't done. He asked him 60 questions. And then God said to Job, listen, let's take a little visit to the zoo, the zoo in, uh, in Jerusalem. So God took him on down to the zoo, and he says, now these animals over here, look at that alligator there, Job. He's got those scales on him, and brother, you could take a spear, and you can't get, do you know how that was made? Do you know how I did that, Job? And he said nothing. And Job, talk about strange things. Look at that ostrich. This guy can run at 50, 60 miles an hour, and he's a bird. <laughs> Do you know how I built that ostrich to run like that? And Job said nothing. Over 60 questions, God gave him a tour of the universe. He showed him his omnipotent power and his wisdom, and then he revealed himself to Job, where Job said, I have heard about you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes, and I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Oh, God revealed that he is almighty God, the omnipotent God that speaks and things are created, an all-loving God that takes care of his children. He has every atom in this universe under control, and surely these 
what we call adverse things that happened to our, our, in our life, including all the catastrophes that happened to Job, were under God's total control. And Job understood that. I was embraced by God and experienced his love. He had no further questions to ask God. All the complaining was over. Didn't need any more answers than that. And now God is revealing to us in the eighth chapter, this most magnificent chapter of God's word, that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and to those that are called according to his purpose. Indeed, soft pillow for a tired head. Because on this pilgrim journey, we suffer. And we do have adversity. But God's using it for our good. Listen to Paul as he continues. And we'll see the heart of what God is doing in our lives. And here it is. He also, I'm sorry, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, these he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let me stop right there. Those who he foreknew, he predestined big words, important words. This is God's plan. Little man has nothing to do with it. God says, all of my children, all that have been born into my family, are going to be like my son Jesus. We need to be conformed to God's son Jesus. And when the pressure is put on and when these adversities happen, they happen to cause us to seek his face and seek his help. And the closer we get to him, the more we know him, the more we become like him. God's purpose in suffering for the child of God is to bring us close to him that we might be like him. This is what it's all about. We are being conformed to his image. And by the way, we need to be conformed to his image because we live in a broken world with a broken spirit. God made Adam, he was upright. He walked with God. And God made Adam in his image. And two who are in total communion and like-minded can walk together with no breakage of fellowship. And with Adam and God walked in the cool of the day, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. God made man to have fellowship with him. A loving God needs people to love. And yes, the triune God loved each other, but God needed more than that. And he created humanity to love them, his children. But when we fell, oh, that image was so badly broken. So badly broken. I mean, let's face it. Cain murdered his brother Abel. The first man ever born was a murderer. The harmony of paradise was lost. And Adam and Eve were no longer the loving wife and submissive husband, not other way around. <laughs> loving husband, submissive wife. They were fighting and arguing, and you can even, can't even imagine what was going on in that household after the fall. Before the fall, perfect love perfect harmony after the fall. That's where the argument started. Why did you have to listen to the snake? Why did God have to make you and give you as, to me as a wife, an argument of woman? <laughs> Why did you have to listen to him for it? You dummy, you took the apple and ate it and you weren't even tempted. Friends, there was no Kleenex in the Garden of Eden in Adam and Eve's home until the fall. And after the fall, the image of Adam and Eve was broken, and we were bro born with a broken image. We come to Jesus. He is in the restoration build business. He's going to conform us to his own image. That's what it's all about. And that is the primary reason why God allows adversity in his children's lives. Now listen to this now. I'm reading in 29, 30 rather, moreover, Paul says, whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. 
These are four golden links of a chain that is forged in heaven. Do you ever wonder what Jesus meant in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John when he said this, My sheep, they hear my voice, they follow me. And my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and they shall never, never perish, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one? is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That, my friends, is a clear, clear eternal security verse, almost as clear as this. Now the Apostle Paul is taking that doctrine that Jesus spoke, being snatched out of the Father's hand, and says this, I'm going to give you a picture of history back and history forward, the whole panorama of eternity. In the past, God, through his foreknowledge, predestinated you. That means a little bit more than just, well, I think this guy is going to come to Jesus. It means more than that, folks. We're dealing with the almighty, sovereign God. We are firebrands snatched out of the fire. The Lord Jesus didn't come down to make a little appeal to us and say, well, maybe you ought to come. No, he came on a rescue mission. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those that are lost. Those who he predestined, he called. And this is an effectual calling. This is the gospel going out. And boy, you're going to respond to this gospel, and God's going to see to it that you respond to this gospel. If he has to do a little arm twisting, he is quite capable of doing that because he loves you. Talk about Billy Graham. He was used more than any other preacher in my own life before my salvation. I remember walking up to a TV set about a month before I was saved, and he was preaching. And you know what? I had listened to many preachers in my life. I laughed at most of them because they were prosperity teachers. And they put on a pretty good show, and I appreciated the acting. But when Billy Graham preached, there was no acting going on. He was preaching the Word of God, and I heard the Word of God, and I didn't want to hear the Word of God because I knew he was telling me the truth. And I literally ran away from that television set. I couldn't listen to it. I felt extraordinarily uncomfortable. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. My reason for not coming to Jesus was not because I lacked light. My reason for not coming to Jesus because I had too much light, and I hated the light. I loved the darkness. Billy, prayed, Billy Graham was preaching light. I was convicted. And God was twisting my arm and making me feel very uncomfortable. Two months later, I came to Jesus, and I was born into God's family an effectual calling, those who he calls. He does what? He justifies, justified by faith, made right in God's sight. And then look at the last link in this golden chain that is forged in heaven that you can't break and nobody else could break because God's the one that made it. Those who he justified, he glorified, period. Glorified is used in the past tense. God sees you already in heaven if you belong to him. Those chains and links cannot be broken. Aren't you glad for that? All the Father gives me shall come to me, and he that comes to me I'll in no wise cast out. All those in my Father's hand, they can't get out of my Father's hand. How wonderful this is, the height of biblical truth we're looking at. Now the Apostle Paul says this as he continues. And by the way, he's overwhelmed with this, the <laughs> this theology. Listen to him as he speaks. That would have been verse 30, right? Mm -hmm. 31. What should we say to these things? What are we, what are we going to say about these things? Uh, <clears throat> if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, nobody. If God's on our side, it doesn't make any difference who's not on our side or who's against us. They can't stop God's work. God says four golden links of a chain, predestinated, called, justified, glorified. Nobody's going to interfere with that. Paul is overwhelmed with this teaching. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Consider. 
God loved us enough to send his son down to die for us on the cross. Do you really suppose he's going to withhold any good thing from us on this pilgrim journey that we're on? Do you really think if he did that for us, that he's going to hold, withhold any good thing on this pilgrim journey that you and I need? I don't think so. It's like Dr. McGee used to say, it's like a man going in and to a jewelry store and a man, a very wealthy man says, listen, I really like you. <clears throat> you got the same last name as I do. I want to do a little something for you. Here's a diamond. It's worth 100,000 bucks. The guy says, you're giving me a diamond? What do I have to do for it? Absolutely nothing. It's free. You can have it. Thank you. Wow, that is, that's astounding. <clears throat> could you give me a, a paper bag that I could carry the diamond out of the store with? No, I don't think I can do that. Get your own bag. No, I don't think the man's going to say that. If he's going to give him a $100,000 diamond, he's going to give him a two-cent sack to carry it in. God says, he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not freely give us all good things? Listen to Paul. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. It's impossible. Our salvation is greater than we could even conceive because it's of God. Our salvation is more secure than most Christians can even imagine. Paul is overwhelmed with this great, wonderful, wonderful teaching. Who is going to separate from the love of God? Reminds me of a story of a man in Chicago. It was in the 1800s. The Chicago fire took place. Something like, I think, 25% of the city burned to the ground. And this man not only lost most of his wealth in that terrible fire, but he lost a son. He only had one son. He lost his boy. And he was just overwhelmed with grief because of that. He was a good friend of D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody went off to England to do a, a, a tour, evangelistic tour, and he decided that he'd join his family and they'd all go over together, his wife and his two daughters. And when it came time to go, he couldn't, he couldn't go. He had some business he had to attend to, so he sent his wife and two daughters over in a, uh, in a ship. And unfortunately, about in the middle of the Atlantic, a terrible storm came up, and that ship sank. And everybody knew about it in America. They heard the word. They weren't sure who survived and who didn't. But when uh, this man's wife got to Great Britain, she sent a, a telegram to her husband and said, I have arrived in London alone. And that meant this man had lost two daughters. Let's see. Now he's lost two daughters and a son, and most of us will. He hopped the next ship to go to be with his wife. And when he got halfway across the Atlantic, the captain took him outside and said, Sir, this is where the ship sank, and this is where your two daughters died. And he just sat at the rail of that ship and composed a song. It is well, it is well with my soul. Now you know that song. It's a very, very well-known Christian song. It is well is well with my soul. Waves of trouble overwhelm me. God's love is deeper than all that. He understood the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. And he understood there's going to be a great reunion someday. That he hadn't lost his two daughters and son. They were going to all meet again in heaven and be together forever. And this man was able to trust the Lord. Not throw in the towel and get bitter and blame God and get an attitude trusted the Lord, wrote a wonderful song that blesses the hearts of God's people to this very day. Over a hundred years, that song has been sung. Now the Apostle Paul, 
last couple of verses says this. I'm reading in verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're counted all day like sheep to the slaughter. He's quoting from the Old Testament where God's Jewish people were put to death by Nebuchadnezzar and other evil dictators. And he says the same way in this dispensation, we're being murdered on a wholesale basis. But Jesus said, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good courage because I've overcome the world. They can't kill us. All they can do is usher us into God's presence. They can't take our life away unless God allows them to. We are more than conquerors to him who loved us. Apostle Paul is coining a word. That word wasn't found in the Greek language. More than conquerors. I'm reading again. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, and he means fallen angels, demons, nor principalities, nor powers, and that's satanic also, nor things present, nor things to come. He's covering everything there is, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No separation from God's love. Nothing can separate us, Paul said. I'm persuaded. I wonder, my Christian friend, are you persuaded? If you're not, you need to be because this is the word of God and we can either accept it or we can reject it and say, I just don't believe it. I think if I sin, I'm going to lose my salvation. You're calling God a liar. You're doubting his word. You're throwing into question his very reputation and ability to be able to keep you as the great shepherd. You really think the ones that come to Jesus, the good shepherd, are going to be able to get away. Dumb sheep like us? I don't think so. I am persuaded nothing shall separate from the love of God. What a wonderful verse this is. What a wonderful chapter. Begins in no condemnation and ends in no separation. It can't get any more wonderful than that. I can't even imagine how it any more wonderful than that. We need to just believe the Word of God and take it at face value for what it is, the Word of God. Well, I'm going to leave it off there. That eighth chapter, what a wonderful chapter it is. I probably went through it too rapidly. You'll forgive me for that. But uh, the ninth chapter is an interesting chapter also, but we're going to have to wait till next time to discuss that. I want to thank you for joining us today in today's broadcast. And I just wanted to say one final thing just as I am without one plea. Jesus told Billy Graham to preach, and he preached that message his entire life. And that's the invitation that God gives to you if you're not born again. Just as you are without one plea, your blood was shed for me. God's arms are open wide to all those who have not trusted Jesus to be their Savior. He's inviting you to come. No matter what you've done, He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to embrace you. He wants to make you His child. Why not come to Jesus, the gift of God's eternal life? God loves you. Jesus died for you, and He rose again the third day. Come to Christ and be born again. Thank you for joining us in the broadcast today. May the Lord bless you until next time.